Um, <clears throat> Aloha and welcome everyone to the Senate Committee on Energy, Economic Development, Tourism for the 1 p.m. hearing. We have two GMs on our agenda today. This meeting is being streamed live on YouTube. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end the hearing due to technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business at 1 p.m. on Thursday, March 16th in Group 229, and a public notice will be posted on the legislature website. Please note we have a one minute limit per testifier, and I do plan to enforce the time limit uh, for these governors' messages. We will first take uh, testimony and then I will give the nominees a chance for a short opening statement before the committee asks questions. Um, for the record, there is a lot of testimony. So I ask that you either stand on your testimony since we have all your testimonies. If not, you guys might drag this thing on that we might have to defer this, just for the record. Um, so first up, uh, in support, Governor, Governor Green. Uh, second, I uh, would like uh, Kristala Yasu. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Chris Sadeyasu, FIBA Director, and standing of testimony, strong support. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to work with them and uh, look forward to uh, many years with them. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, Dennis Ling. Yes, hello, Chair, Vice Chair, committee members, uh, Dennis Ling, uh, standing in strong support. Thank you. Next, uh, Jay Butte. In person, I see you next. Uh, uh, Jimmy Nakatani. Thank you. Next up, Len Higashi. Thank you. Uh, Don Cheng. The department stands on our written testimony and support. Thank you. Uh, Gwen Yamamoto. Good afternoon. The Thank you. Uh, Akeem, okay, not here. In support, uh, Gary Suganuma. In support, Glenn Scott, you know, you pile guys in support. Um, in person, I Michael Minakata, not here. In support, you know, anyone else in support? They're not on this list that, that's, that is, do they like say support? Thank you. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. We're just getting ahead of Korea Ministries and strong support for the nominee. Okay, thank you, George. John. John McGrew, the story of the board, strong support. Okay, thank you, John. Finally, Sakola Publishing, strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else on oh, no, um, jump up? Okay, too many names. I'm not could take forever for each of this. Um, do we have anybody on Zoom? Sorry. Yeah. Aloha, Caroline Carl, Hawaii Energy, standing on our written support. Thank you for the opportunity, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee members. Thank you. Uh, I think we have somebody else on Zoom too. I think anybody else on Zoom? No, no one else currently. No one else. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mark, if you want to come up and start there. Thank you, Chair Quaid, uh, Vice Chair Kai, Senator Kim, Kai Kim. I'm deeply grateful. I I, I did answer uh, seven questions uh, and. The written testimony is there, uh, and I stand on that. But I, I just would like to add a few further comments. I'm really grateful for the trust that uh, Governor Green has bestowed in me uh, to take on the Hawaii State Energy Office at this really critical time. And I'm humbled, truly humbled to be here today. Um, some of the key points overall, I think in summary, uh, I think there's a lot of um, I bring a lot of energy knowledge, experience, and sensitivity to the overall economic, cultural needs and desires of the people uh, throughout Hawaii. You know, there were a lot of discussion about the experience. Uh, I've been in this space for uh, more than 30 years. Uh, it really bridged three critical parts of my life, almost three different lifetimes. 
Uh, but I think the probably the most uh, apropos is the time spent here in Hawaii and since 2003 with the Office of Wine Affairs, which I truly viewed as an apprenticeship, uh, allowed me to also work on energy matters there uh, to try to reduce costs for, uh, for Hawaiian beneficiaries. Um, as, and during the time that I spent as head of economic development for the whole Office of Wine Affairs, um, after that, uh, I was very fortunate to spend five years at the, as energy office administrator and I detail uh, some of the key accomplishments that occurred there uh, in the areas of energy efficiency with a significant amount of energy savings performance contracts, leading the nation for five years consecutively, uh, and also working well on, on, uh, with the legislature on key matters like community-based renewable energy, uh, which is delivering uh, renewable energy opportunities to all parts of our uh, Hawaii, uh, all parts of Hawaii, I mean, even uh, low and moderate income individuals, people that don't have rooftop solar. Uh, and of course, we passed the, uh, with your support, 100% mandate. Um, working with Senator Lee, who was then Representative Lee and then Senator Gabbard. Um, the time at the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, which really refined my skills and took a lot of these programs internationally. Um, and this division for the energy office is, is really clear. Um, we want to get our fair share of the federal funding that's available to us. We want to be able to be competitive, but we most importantly want to create um, economic development opportunities. We want to reduce costs over time most importantly, reduce price, oil price volatility. And I think we have excellent programs to, to be able to do that. And, and primarily with uh, collaboration with the Department of Energy, right now we have outstanding $1.2 billion in grant opportunities that we, have, we are in the midst of applying for today. I'm happy to go into detail about any or all of those uh, matters and uh, really uh, here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glick. Oh, committee members, you guys go ahead. Oh, so Mr. Wilcox, you can share. No, the Supreme Court decision two days ago, killing Kohunua, uh, was, I found, surprising, considering we have a very successful biomass plant on Kauai that burns wood uh, to the benefit of, of the residents of Kauai. What's your take? I mean, since biomass is just one of the tools in the sure. firm renewable opportunities out there, what's your position on the balance between instrument and firm renewable power for the state? Well, there's no doubt, and you bring up a really important issue that uh, which there's a lot of analysis around, which is as you get to extremely high rates of renewable, you're gonna need about 10 to 15, possibly even 20% of power that you can consider dispatchable, that you can immediately provide 24 hours a day. Uh, biomass could be a very good, so, uh, opportunity for that. We also know that hydrogen uh, is emerging as a uh, firm, as a storage means, which could actually provide that firm renewable. Uh, so that's also very exciting. Uh, I think those are two important aspects other than liquid fuels. Uh, and liquid fuels, as we know, very difficult and costly to um, do that renewable. But biofuels remains also one of those options and biodiesel, a renewable biodiesel. So do you agree with the Supreme Court decision from two weeks ago? Well, I, I can honestly say that I, um, I did not read the uh, opinion, um, but I do know one thing that I, I can say is that uh, in looking at whether or not the, the appropriateness of this, I think is it from a technology standpoint and from the ability to provide dispatchable power, it, it would definitely have provided that. What I can't really comment on is whether or not it could have done that in a really cost-effective way, and whether or not the, um, you know, the um, the Public Utilities Commission, the Consumer Advocate, and all of the other concerns would have overridden the actual contractual obligations that were underway. I don't, I don't, I'm not really in a position to be able to to comment on that. But I can say that certainly from a resource standpoint, it, it could have served in the renewable picture. 
in 2020, I think one of the few legislative mistakes we made was to prematurely shut down the coal plant. Um, 2020, there was an opportunity in 2021 as well as in 2022 to you know just pull back and give uh, the renewable energy sector time to get through the supply chain, permitting, and all of those issues. If you were the, the state energy chief energy officer back at that time, would you have supported the idea of holding back on the immediate shutdown, or not the immediate, but the September 2022 shutdown of the coal plant uh, until things lined up properly? Or would you have taken the course that your predecessor took, which was just let it go and cross our fingers and hope for the best? Well, in hindsight, you know, one could say, well, there turned out to be no rolling blackouts and it, it actually worked. Um, I, I think that one thing that we will attempt to do may be different, I'm not sure, uh, but one thing we'll attempt to do is carefully plan, and I think we'll be more pragmatic in terms of the staging and phasing of these things. And I think it was quite clear that with supply chain disruptions that didn't allow as much renewable energy to be deployed in a timely fashion. There might have been some need for flexibility there, uh, but again, that's all in hindsight. Um, I, I'm not here to second guess what what uh, transpired, but I am grateful, and I, I do I do have to commend Hawaiian Electric for standing up and having their own contingency plans. I recall uh, Shelley Camaro making very strong statements that we were not going to have brownouts. And blackouts, and and she turned out to be correct. We didn't have brownouts and blackouts, but we have a thirty percent increase for all rate payers in the state. Was that a justifiable uh, give for the lack of brownouts and blackouts? Well, the the um, you know the decision uh, that was a pretty broad decision, and I know that the legislature was involved in making that decision uh, about removing something that was a you know effectively a six cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, contribution, and I think those have to be extremely well thought out transitions. At some point, coal was going to have to be phased out. At that moment, uh, again, in hindsight, one could argue that uh, the staging and phasing could have been done a heck of a lot better with less price cost disruption to uh, the consumer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Favela? Yeah. Thank you. Things. Uh, let's just start off on uh, on the behalf of the Energy Office. You submitted comments um, regarding Senate Bill 1247 um, related to waste to energy. Your comments was that the efforts with development for waste to energy facility was not successful due to lack of feedstock waste for the project um, to be effective. If confirmed, are you going to be keeping an open mind regarding? and your waste to energy technology that we have successfully um, continued to move forward and what's happening in Germany. That's one. No, absolutely, Senator Favela. I think that's a really important point. Uh, waste to energy is, is, a, is an effective technology. You do have to always manage supply and demand and in order to make it operate on an economic basis. But I do know that with, um, you know, in the planning effort we recently had in, uh, that were still underway in Molokai, uh, there's been attempts to actually use some of the waste uh, wood and other things. And that's a consideration. Again, the community is gonna have to weigh in whether or not it wants to actually have a waste energy plant, but um, that's, that's always a consideration. There are, um, in Maui, there's uh, waste to uh, paralysis that's going to uh, potentially create hydrogen. Uh, and that's going to be another really great waste to energy uh, technology. So we definitely will have a, an open mind on that. Okay, thank you. And then I just wanted to say, so do you, do you know why um, you're not having enough feedstock for the one that is going now? Do you know the current reason why that's coming in as their energy chair? Do you know? Well, I, I do know that, um, that well, some of it still continues to go to uh, landfill and it's, you know, the separation issues and where it's being placed. But I think most of it uh, is that with the expansion of H power, uh, it just simply was too large to, hand, to be able to absorb all of the waste. But are there other 
issues that you wanted to point out? Yeah, so the reason why I say that is because when I was on the neighborhood board, I was 110% supportive of us using taxpayers' money to bill it. When I was there on the beautiful day of the, all the beautiful words that they said that never come true, burn tires, burn metal, burn everything. That's what it's for. Taxpayers believed in that, and that wasn't true. To this day, the city get charged every year a fee for not having enough uh, waste. If you run one plant that we taxpayers paid for and now the city is getting fined, how can you justify fining the city when you tell us we can throw away at your part at the power plant that we own? That's the problem. Every single year, they don't take tires now. In my district, Ever Beach to Makaha, we get millions of tires in the ocean and on the side streets because now the convenience centers don't take tires. They don't burn the refrigeration, the path plastic, they don't take bed frames. They don't take, um, excuse me, they don't take the uh, box springs. So all of the things they're telling us what we cannot do. So the next question that I ask, ask you, since we're on that subject to waste to energy, what do you know about the new um, waste to energy technology? Since you'll be coming in as a new um, energy person, do you know anything about the new technology of the uh, waste to energy plant? Well, the most recent uh, visit that I had was with Mayor Benny uh, just a few days ago, and uh, they laid out uh, several different technologies. Japan, of course, does an outstanding job. They actually have waste and energy facilities in residential areas. They're completely surrounded by buildings, uh, and they're able to do that effectively. So I was deeply impressed. I've actually visited uh, those in Nishinomiya. Uh, myself over the last 24 months and again have been impressed with the state of the technology and hope that at some point Hawaii can have something of that quality. And the reason why I bring this up is because uh, um, I, I can send you the information later. I have, I have some questions but I'll, I'll, I'll yield to my colleagues. The reason why I say that is because the waste or energy plant that I had proposed to my colleagues and to the rest of the centers, this plant is right next to an ocean. Mm. And it's look like one beautiful very nice. building. Yeah. So, and it, the CO2s and the, very much um, coming out is almost zero to none. And the ash that some of my colleagues in the house was concerned about, the ash will get moved over with the magnet, take all the metals out, and they'll be used in construction material. So it won't go in the landfill. Reason for this new technology that we're trying to introduce here to the islands is because we don't want no more landfills in our backyard. We have all the pilau on our side of the island. We need new technology, new technology. Well, I'll, I'll you for now, I'll Chair. Okay, thank you. I just never like leave you out because once Senator King get a hold of the mic, but you might not have another chance. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Senator King. With that, I don't know that I want to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> it's so juicy, that's what it was. <laughs> I feel like I'm being set up here. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, being here. Uh, you talk about, and you did also just talk about clean hydrogen, and you were with um, DBED. Were you there when Ted Liu was, was the... Um, so uh, I, I came in actually in the very last year. Uh, I was hired to, under ARA, to set up a loan fund. Uh, so... Um, so you didn't do anything with energy? That Pardon me? You didn't do anything with energy no, with did did no, that. No, yeah. Okay, because I recall that they had a, a contract a for hydrogen. Yes. A hydrogen contract, which we did an investigation on. It was a mess, and I wanted to know what happened to that contract and what happened to the hydrogen um, program that we paid millions of dollars for. Do you recall? No, that, that was before my time. Because okay, yeah. it was finally awarded to Kolahala. And I think it was $8.7 million for hydrogen back then, which was, you know, the leading so-called energy. And yet here we are, you know, a decade later, and I don't know how we spend this kind of money, how we have these RFPs awarded, and then I don't know that we have anything to show for it. Yeah, unfortunately, that never ended up at the energy office while I was there previously. Okay, how do we how do we um, <clears throat> keep from having those kinds of things happen as we go forward? 
Well, several things. I mean, you raise an extremely important point about the process under which energy pro programs should be developed. Uh, one of them has to do with procurement, making sure it's fair and open, transparent. Um, and we do have a good back ourselves, a good back office team that does that. Um, but we also have to contribute to the rules for competitive bidding by the utility and, and by the utilities and we participate in those dockets and that's critically important. But I think, you know, the bigger question is about how do we not repeat mistakes? You know, how do we make sure that we get out in front of the market? And it's hard for government to do that. What we do is we are now forming more partnerships with, with the industry and on this hydrogen hub effort, um, there'll be more than 50 partners that are part of that and having the innovations that are being developed and having that openly discussed is, is really important. So it's just not a gr small group of people in the back room kind of making decisions on these really important investments. And I think we'll figure out a way actually to have discussions with public, particularly if we're going to be using, let's say geothermal to generate electricity to, to produce hydrogen. We have, have to spend more time it may take us an extra 12 months before we start to actually produce anything. But if we don't do that, I think there will be sus suspicion about how we went about doing it. So how do we learn from that if nobody even remembers that contract and the money that we spent? Do we have a report? Does DBED have a report on the hydrogen um, RFP that was awarded to Kolohawa? I think it was $8.7 million. Do we even have, I mean, right? We need to look at what what the money was spent on, what right. we learned from it, and if we're going to go forward, because, you know, everybody has a good idea and they want to do an RFP, and then a year, 10 years later, we look back and say, what did we spend this money on? I'll be happy to look into it. Okay. Also, in your um, testimony or your questionnaire that you answered, uh, under clean transportation, you say, I initiated an assessment of Hawaii's approach to reducing fossil fuel in transportation by revaluing uh, HCEI roadmap on transportation. So what was the what was the outcome of that? So there were, um, out of all these different tactics, there were really over 100 of them that were originally uh, evaluated. There were 22 that we thought might past political muster and I would say about a half dozen of them are actually being worked on by the Department of Transportation. Uh, some of it has to do with uh, transit oriented design, some of it's with EV incentives, uh, EV charging stations, um, and some other measures. I can tell you that overall I completed that study and it was released in 2015 and I left the energy office in 2016, um, I was disappointed there, there wasn't further action on working with the communities and the broader stakeholders to, do, to actually deploy those tactics. I thought a lot of them made a lot of sense. Um, but you know, the thing about transportation is that unlike electricity where you can mandate the RPS on two utilities, you, you have to deal with 1.4 million vehicles that are owned by individuals. So you have to come up with different <laughs> strategies to make that work. And it was a lot harder. Um, but we do have teams now that are actively engaged in that. And they are actually performing pieces of that study. But we will do a lot more strategically now. I think there's a lot of work to do to follow up that with that ICCT uh, report that you mentioned, well, which I thought was a good report. Well, again, you know, just your statement that you're disappointed because you left and it didn't get followed up on. I mean, that's what happens in government, right? We have somebody there, take the initiative or whatever, and then they leave and then the ball gets dropped. And, you know, we spend time and money and effort and then it gets dropped. And now we're back here now talking about this. And I, every time there's a change, and I don't know how we how we plan for that or how we stay on top of that and how we hold people accountable. Um, you also you also talked about the you established the legislature adopt, adopted Act 164 on the Hawaii multi-unit dwelling EV charging working group that you chaired. 
Yes. And again, what became of that? Because we have bills announced back in 2015, right? And we have bills about there's just not enough charging stations. Should there be more charging stations? You, you know, there's, there's all these concerns. So here we are, what, eight years, seven years later, and we're still talking about the same things. Well, definitely, the, that was a really interesting working group. And um, there were one or two legislative matters that were proposed. One of them involved trying to direct some of the public benefits fees towards rebates for the building owners uh, so that they could actually make those transformer upgrades. A lot of the buildings actually would have, it turned out to be quite costly to be able to upgrade it to have series of 60 amp sort of charging, you know, chargers in these buildings. So it turned out to not be a real trivial thing to actually do these upgrades. And I think the, the biggest issue, and I think that the ones that didn't make progress, I think some of the buildings actually went forth and put in these level two chargers that don't take as much energy, but to, to actually put in fast chargers, like the ones you have at your home, uh, that will require more upgrades. And I think we're gonna have to uh, follow up and direct some of this federal funding that we have now to cover fixed costs like this uh, to be able to make some progress on multi-dwelling uh, units. And I think more importantly on workplace charging, because that's what, that happens, most people are at work in the middle of the day when we have this oversupply of solar. And that's really when you need to be plugging in. I think the multi-dwelling unit actually has some limitations because you don't want them charging when they come home because that's really not the right time. So I think it's much more important. I think we learned also from that multi-dwelling task force was that that wasn't the end all. There was a supposition that that's what really needed to happen. And I think it was quite clear that there's limitations to how much you should be able to charge at these dwellings when it'd be better to charge at work. And the thing is though, you can charge like after midnight that's right. 6 a.m., which is a better time. So there are timers on there. Yeah. But then, you know, a lot of these ones at the shopping centers where employees get hold of a charger and they sit there all day long or other people come in and sit there, there's no limit. So there needs to be some kind of accountability EV <laughs> and, yeah, and enforcement if, if this is to work. So I hope those are things that you're going to uh, take up and seriously look at because otherwise how we move forward and, with getting more people on an electric vehicle. And by the way, I do have an electric vehicle. So. Well, thank you. <laughs> That's um, very good. So, yeah, and I do charge at home. So, thank you. <laughs> After nine. After nine. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, along the same lines of what Senator came out to say, I do park in that EV stall until she decided to make a bill <laughs> that I cannot park my gas car in there. Oh, but, indeed. but yeah, so <laughs> uh, I was like, okay, it's fine. Okay. Even though we're paying with taxpayer dollars, but um, you know, along that line, I, I wanted to ask, you know, because there's been a lot of projects, um, energy projects that are out there, um, and and what I have been dealing with is that while we transition out from different types of energy and solar, um, once it's installed, the jobs um, become an issue. Um, workforce is no longer needed in most cases. Will you engage with the different um, labor or workforce or unions to have that conversation on how we can tr transition workforce um, of existing energy uh, companies into us not basically having workforce disappear while we have renewable energy projects on the table. Yeah, thank you, Senator. I think, uh, Chair, I think that's actually one of the more important things that we'll be doing now that we weren't doing before. And we became the energy lead on uh, the Good Jobs Hawaii uh, effort with working with community colleges. And we just recently hired someone to lead that effort and we'll have uh, sort of an extended team with our wayfinders to actually go do outreach in the communities, identify people that would, uh, and, and actually to encourage people to uh, go through these programs with the community colleges. And one of our goals, new goals, is to ha have, I would like to see at the end of the four years, a thousand people go through that program. That would be, to me, a real big accomplishment. Okay. Well, 
So, so, so with that, will, will the engagement be in consideration of the different labor unions that represent some of these workers for that conversation? Absolutely. Thank yes. you. Um, what, one other question. Uh, so what is set a goal of having 100% renewable energy by 2045? How far along do you think Hawaii is in reaching that goal? Well, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that we have six independent grids and each one is different, really fundamentally different. You know, we're all very excited and happy that uh, Kauai Island Utility Cooperative is at 70% today. Uh, and, you know, when price volatility happened because of uh, the Ukraine war, um, prices only, the rates only went up by 5%, whereas in Molokai, they went up by 40% because there's only 19% renewable there. Um, the planning effort in some of the places that haven't made progress is to make sure that they're probably more efficient and effective ways. And also it has to, this gets back to, I think Senator Kim, one of Senator Kim's points, uh, or, uh, quite, or in my answer to her about procurement, we have to figure out ways to reduce risk for developers that they can and have such strong community support for the plans that we're gonna get better bids, more cost-effective bids so that we can actually achieve these projects on time and they won't go away after six years. We had a number of false starts and I think Senator Wakai also mentioned another one of those false starts. Once you start something, I do believe there is some somewhat of an obligation to follow through and um, I think, you know, in terms of um, Hawaii County, you know, they have a diverse uh, energy mix. We're going to help them, I hope, uh, be able to have greater community discussions and sort of complete the picture with um, perhaps if the community supports it more geothermal, uh, obviously hydro um, and uh, more solar and solar and batteries as well. And we're now exploring hydrogen in that mix as well. So there, there are definitely tools in the toolkit. Uh, we just have to kind of uh, understand what's going on in each island and assist where appropriate. And then also kind of take advantage of these. There's going to be a pool of funds over the next five years that if we don't apply for it, we will not get it. It will go to other states. So we must, I feel it's an obligation, we do that effectively. And if we do that, we can cover some of those fixed costs that it would have been difficult for the utility and for the ratepayer to kind of uh, do. So I think it's appropriate for us to seek that and, uh, and we're committed to do that. So I think you've actually probably been one of many that have had challenges on outreach in the community. I know when you uh, took on the challenge to me with the Molokai Clean Energy Hui, like like most departments, they have literally shied away or walked away from no agreement between gathering of community members for consensus. So thank you for that. I think that's a huge challenge that probably could rub off some of the other departments. Um, but you know, with, with that being said, uh, thank you for that answer. I, I really wanted to hear what you had to say about that. Um, I know we're running on time. Uh, Just a few more. So Senator Pavel, please. Um, and we already talked about this earlier, I wasn't here, but since the closure of the AES plant, the energy course, of course, been very um, to the roof um, to, for the um, residents. I, I had asked Iko Hiko, who makes extremely tons of money, probably can fit in this capital, money, money they make off us, to offset the cost at that time. And of course, the answer was no. Going forward, you know, what action would you take to uh, reduce the increase of the eco energy cost of the residents is paying on. What, 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 what can you do as coming in as the energy chair? Well, one of the things that I'm doing uh, as a part of my routine function in this early stage is to meet with some of the other independent power producers and to see whether or not it's possible to pick up um, some of their very effective power generation, which could you know, sort of fill in some of the gaps for AES. Probably not at as low a cost, but but in a good way. Uh, one of them is uh, Kalilo uh, Partners, which has an extremely efficient uh, combined cycle generation unit. 
So I want to explore some of those traditional routes as well as looking at uh, some of these other uh, things that we're trying to do to, you know, part of the picture will continue to try to um, improve efficiency. Because if you do that, then you, that's the cheapest way you actually sort of back off demand. So, um, you know, as led here, Carolyn Carl and Hawaii Energy, we're, we're gonna definitely beef up efforts to support some efficiency, as I mentioned, energy savings, performance contracts, and other things. Because I have a very, very uh, concern on the previous energy chair. Came to here where you're sitting. Didn't have to ask him too many questions, but the question that I had asked him, if there was a way, as him being the energy chair, because I asked him, was it a federal decision or was it a state decision? He said it was a state decision. Clearly what Senator Wekai said he did. So I asked him, as, as the role as the energy chair, what role did he play in trying to prevent it to being closed, come to back to us and ask us for an extension of two years, since we was we already knew during COVID that those, those solar companies wasn't up to par and they still were sleeping at the wheel. It's a different story. But anyway, the bottom line is he used the word, he misspoke to me outside here, not on a TV. He used the word misspoke because he told me in the hearing that he talked to the subject chair about this to try to extend it. And he said it was too late. Well, he didn't misspoke. He lied to me. Because he also told the subject chair later on when he left this meeting to talk to Senator Goykai and let him know that he told me that in the meeting. And quote unquote, Senator Goykai said, So what are you trying to say? You want me to lie for you? So these are the things that we have to be very careful when it comes to the taxpayers' money. I was very upset that my community is suffering. When you say we don't have rollout, we don't have enough firm energy. Out of all these programs and all of this stuff, how much firm energy do these solar farms, windmills actually producing right now? How much firm energy? Well, again, it's the definition of firm energy, but um, some, some of the arrays with batteries are providing enough dispatchable energy up to a certain percentage. And the reason why I bring that up, because you said we didn't. Well, in my community, from Everbeach to Nanakuli, yeah. we had blackouts. Not just rolling, we had blackouts for a fire to get up, everything's off, ice boxes for defrosting. So it's not like it was just a few minutes. We, we, we have, you know. And then I heard, I don't know what, what news it was, the Hawaiian Electric came out and said, oh, if you know, we can get guys to come up with better ideas and get away from solar and windmills because it's not working. You as being the um, energy chair, the question that I have for you is that, um, uh, what role will you play in the renewable energy projects built today? And do you have any, um, um, because the previous chair before you in 2019, 2020, told me that was he going to have in a hearing with Senator um, 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 uh, Tai Kahele, he said we wasn't going to have any more windmills. But the reason why I ask this is because um, as you will be the, the, the renewable, I'm um, the energy chair, how would you feel and what role would you have with, with uh, and would you support offshore wind energy projects? Very interesting that you asked that question. Um, I plan on meeting with uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management when I'm in Washington in the summer uh, to discuss uh, plans for that uh, because they're, they are faced with uh, projects that want permits uh, and to talk about what's the appropriate way to do that. Um, and as you know, there's some obstacles with uh, designation of available space that the Department of Defense would support into PACOM. And so we have to resolve some of those issues. But if we're going to, you know, as you, I'm sure you well know, um, if you really want to balance the power of solar, wind can do that because it, it can blow, you know, at all times of the day. And particularly in places where there's really high capacity factor, and some of these are offshore, um, you know, you could really balance that and create some, essentially, you're not gonna replace, it's not become dispatchable, but it will essentially strengthen the grid. So I think it should be considered. 
And, uh, and I know that there are some really interested parties in pursuing that. So uh, we do intend to uh, look at that very carefully. Okay, by putting these um, windmills in the water, you think it would have a negative impact on tourism? Um, it has to be done responsibly, and I think it has to be done in areas where it wouldn't. Okay, um, so you, you, you talked about the military and all of those guys, yeah? Yeah. A big impact is going to be on the native Hawaiian people right. who use the ocean for their life. Yeah. Okay? And I'm going to be totally telling you the truth. I am 100% against those windmills in the ocean. Because nothing that you can tell me, you can tell me about the wind, okay? The best wind is coming from Hawaii Kai, that side. You see any windmills, any solar projects there? Anything else? Zero? Nothing. So the question I'm asking to you, before you go talk to these guys in Washington, you better come to our community, because they wanted to put Adam in, can ask us, I made up him, said, 134 windmills from Ever Beach to Waianae in our waters, five miles out. That's gonna change our lives. A platform is more big than this building. And it's not gonna even connect to land. It's gonna to connect to batteries. How is that gonna help us who goes out there and live and they tell us, hey, so much feed from the windmill or a platform you can't fish? Those are the things that concern me because I don't give a rip what the military state. I like them out in the belong here. They only tell us what food do, but it doesn't concern us. It always concerns them, them. Polluting our community. That will pollute our ocean. When it breaks, where do you think the debris gonna come? Ever Beach, Maraculi, why not? It hurt our industry. This is not the way to go because I'm gonna tell you right now, Japan, you talk about Japan, talk about China, talk about all other countries. The question is, how come we're not entertaining the wave technology? They said that 20 years ago, I heard about this. How come we not, I don't hear not one person since Scott Glenn to you talking about wave energy. Because that wave energy, when you make the platform, it not only produces a lot of great energy, during the storm it covers itself. You heard Hawaiian Electric, during these big heavy storms and rain, it couldn't get any of the power from the solar farms and windmill. So why would we want to go into the ocean when we have natural disasters, tsunami warnings, and high waves? So that's the stuff that we got to think about because we're always talking about we let go green. To what extent? Do we extinct us? So please think about it as you go forward, as you being, if you get confirmed to be the energy chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Oh, Senator Wakai. Yeah, one quick question. I think uh, Senator Favela asked the most important question of the afternoon, which was the cost to consumers. And, you know, when you look at the PPAs that are coming in, from what I understand, solar plus batteries coming in at about 11 cents per kilowatt hour, far cheaper than petroleum uh, was or is. But instead of the prices going down as we put more renewables on the grid, it's gone in the complete opposite direction. We went from 36 cents per kilowatt hour to 42 cents. So in your mind, I mean, if, you're, if, you, if HECO is buying at 11 cents per kilowatt hour and charging all of us as HECO customers 42 cents per kilowatt hour, is that justifiable? And if it's not, what would you as the state energy officer do to drive down the cost so it's closer to the national average of 12 cents per kilowatt hour, instead of having us all burdened with paying almost four times the national average for electricity costs in the state. Extremely important points, Senator Wakai. Um, the energy costs of, you know, a kilowatt hour of, of rate um, payer cost is less than half of the overall bill, you know, the, the energy cost component. So. There's the poles and the wires and the transformers and the, you know the, the essentially the grid, the grid management. We have to reduce the cost of the grid management. Uh, but I think the single biggest way that we can kind of deal with the energy cost is the and, and, I, and this is one area again looking at KIUC. 100% may not be you know there may be disagreement at this extremely high levels, but we know that at 70%, it's going to re reduce oil price volatility and it will help rate pairs. So we have to get more of these projects then in place economically. And one thing that we can help do is reduce the time frame that these projects get built from five years to three years. So that's gonna be a big part of, of our push is to come up with strategies to do that. And I think that will re help reduce the cost of, of energy, renewable energy. 
But how in the world, if, if he goes buying energy for cheaper today than they were, let's say, five, 10 years ago, can that increase the cost? Not as if they reinvented their grid. It's right. the same old grid, dilapidated as it is. I don't quite understand how it is that their PPA is coming down and the cost to all of us go up. I mean, somehow these lines need to cross at a certain point. And what can you do to help us other than trying to get more renewables online? Even if we get more renewables online, the track record shows that that doesn't matter. The rate pair is still taking in the shorts. Well, I mean, I, again, Hawaiian Electric hasn't gotten to the point that KIUC has. So that when it gets to that level, I think there will be a, a, a fundamental shift. But we also have to be extremely mindful of how effective they are about the grid transformation part. And we will be there uh, weighing in on those dockets. Thank you. Oh. Okay, thank you, Mr. Glick. We are going to go for a, uh, we're going to switch over to uh, GM534. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, next up is GM534. Uh, uh, first person up, Chris Tadayasu. Oh, well, Governor Green in support, Chris Tadayasu. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Chris Tadayasu with DVID. Strong support for uh, standing testimony. It's been a pleasure working with Dane. Uh, he's a very sharp individual, has task oriented, and very good for the department. So thank you. Thank you. Next up, Dennis Ling. Yes, Chair. Uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis Ling stands strong support of this government. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Maria Lucia Pasqual. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, and the members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to provide support for GM534 to support the nomination for uh, our Deputy Director. My name is Lucy Pasqual and I've been in the DBED ASO since uh, January 13 of 2023. Yeah. So within just a couple of months that I have known Mr. Wicker and working closely with him, I could see that he has vast experience and skill set for working collaboratively with 10 attached agencies and four core programs of DBED, being, being able to identify their mission and align them with the overall DBED strategies and governor's priorities. <laughs> so these accomplishments transcend to advocating funds for payroll, other current expenses, and necessary capital improvement projects that sustain the department's operation so that we can better serve the people of Hawaii. So for this and other reasons, I strongly urge for his confirmation as the Deputy Director. Thank, Thank you. you. Next up, John DeFries. John DeFries, Hawaii Tourism Authority, we stand in full support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Jimmy Nakatani. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Jimmy Nakatani, Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Daniel Orden Dick, Orden Den Denker. Thank you. Next, Len Higashi. Thank you. Uh, next up, Don Cheng for DLNR. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Denise Matsuburo. Matsubara, sorry. Good afternoon, chairs, members of the committee, Denise Sari Matsubara for HHFDC. As ex executive director for HHFDC, it's really a privilege um, for me to express my strong support uh, for the confirmation of Dane Wicker. Um, during my time in serving in various capacities, I've found Dane Wicker to be a very dedicated and conscientious in individual, and he's driven for results. It's hard to find in government. When you have those individuals, you gotta hang on to them. Economic workforce development and energy efficiency and affordable housing are critical issues for the state. With Dane's skill set and his experience, he has the right person for the job. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Dane. Uh, next up, Jay Bute in support. Uh, yeah. uh, Gwen Yamamoto Lao. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, next up, Mark Glick. Thank you. Uh, 
Gregory Bar Barbour on Zoom. Hi, uh, Chair DeQuaid, uh, Vice Chair Wakai, uh, Greg Barber from the Natural Energy Lab in Conai. Stand on my testimony in strong support. Uh, Dane, he sees the big picture. He has practical, uh, realistic assessment and straightforward thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Department of Health. Okay, in support, uh, Douglas Murdoch, Chief Information Officer in support. Uh, so I got numerous people in support. Um, Louis Oliveria, Sabrina N N Nasir, uh, Tommy Johnson, Sharon Hurd, Scott Glenn, Gary S Suga Numa, Akeem, Executive Director for Public Housing, uh, David Inc. in support. Derek Kawakami in support. Michael Tahili in support. Uh, oh, Chris Dilani in person. Are you here? Nope, in support. Michael Minikata. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Blue Portable Center is support. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Aaron Mahi in support. Not here. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Paul, she strongly oh. supports staff, mainly primarily because of his interaction with the community he's been very good. Thank you. Uh, Leroy Chin Chinzio Jr. in person in support. Um, Mufi Hanneman in support. Chris West in support. Dustin Dawson in support. Jeffrey Mueller. You know, you don't pile guys in support. I can give you guys the pick if you guys look at them later. But, um, <laughs> Scott Murakami in person. Hello, Chair Dukoy, <clears throat> Vice Chair Wakai, members of the committee. I'm Scott Murakami. I'm here in my individual capacity, testifying in strong support for Deputy Director Ricker. Um, first off, I did want to, I'm going to stand on my written testimony that you have, but I did want to take a moment to just kind of thank uh, Dane for his 20, near over 22 years of public service, um, especially in 2019 and 2020. You know, as um, I've testified in or provided for you in my written testimony and as other people prior to me have testified, Dane is incredibly intelligent. He's very quick in grasping complex issues. And that was tremendously helpful to us at the start of COVID. When we saw the degradation of the UI system, you know, I tried to explain to everybody what the situation was. And it was people like Dane who could understand the complexities and put it into a larger picture that he could understand the challenges we face and also the solutions that we we're using to remedy it. So. Um, in his capacity as the direct deputy director, I can tell you that his grasp of um, cluster economic development is going to tremendously help us, especially with his drive thank to you, Scott, gather it all. Time, so time thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank you. Next up, Georgia Skinner. So Georgia, oh, Georgia left in support. Uh, and then, yeah, I can clean you guys. I'm seeing that like, we don't know. But um, for the record, I. Testimony all in support. Uh, in, in, oh, anybody else? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, Brian. I'm sorry. Anybody else want to testify that's here today? Well, no use of the stand, Chair. I did want to speak on behalf of the farming community. It's a different group in here. I'll make it quick. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Brian Miyamoto here on behalf of the Hawaii Farm Bureau. We are in strong support of the nominee. Uh, we appreciate uh, Dane's background, experience, his work ethic, but he understands farming. He understands that farming is a business. And we're excited, we're optimistic on the growth of agriculture with, if uh, Mr. Wicker is confirmed as a deputy director. I've personally known Dane for 13 years. I've worked with him collaboratively on many agriculture issues. And again, we're excited and we urge the committee to confirm Mr. Wicker for deputy director of the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. Chair, just want to uh, stand in. Strong support of Dean uh, Wicker as deputy director of the Red Duck Moya CDA. Thanks, Dave. No, you was there, you can just slide up. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Vice Chair, Vice Chair of the Committee, Angela Melody, I'm testifying on behalf of CARES. Um, in support of Dean Wicker, um, he is very passionate about his work and he's a good parent. So, um, yep in support of his nomination. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Anybody else want to testify in support? Dane. Ah, okay. 
Hello, Chair DeCoy, Vice Chair Wakai, Senators Kim and Favela. I'm honored by and humbled by this opportunity to serve the Governor Green Administration and the state as a Deputy Director for the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. I also want to thank all those who took time out of their schedules to prepare and submit testimonies supporting my nomination. It's, your words of encouragement are humbling and very much appreciated, so mahalo. Uh, through my career in the State Senate and in the City and County of Honolulu, I served in capacities that provided me to learn and look at resources to put together a larger piece of the puzzle. Uh, in my role, I plan to work collaboratively with our attached agencies and programs and start breaking down the silos between our um, departments and attached agencies. I plan to expand economic development outside of Honolulu and the urban core and focus planning and resources in our rural communities and on our neighbor islands. In working with the DBED director, we are putting together a strategic direction. Currently looking at the top five sectors in Hawaii, we are at real estate, government, hospitality and food services, healthcare and social assistance, and retail trade. We didn't complete studies and previously drafted strategic plans within the department. It is helping us craft a strategic direction. Reviewing the data provided by our research analysis and economic development division, it is helping us to identify where we can move the GDP needle on industries that match our culture and resources. These areas include exports and trade, an increase in import substitution, increasing the competitiveness of Hawaii's businesses by providing them facilities, equipment, and a skilled workforce. Tech and innovation, we need to expand and grow our manufacturing industries, our energy industry, and our creative industries, and we also must strengthen Hawaii's supply chain. DBIT strategic direction focuses on four pillars to expand our economy and grow our tax base. Pillar one, economically sustainable Hawaii. We need to include how to be economically sustainable, not just talk about sustainability. Businesses have to survive. We have to help with their business plans and know what resources and what assistance or incentives may help these industries scale up. Pillar two, creative and innovative industries. We have to adopt best practices. We have to push innovative industries that are appropriate for Hawaii. Hawaii can become an energy think tank when we have to leverage geothermal, OTEC, and hydrogen. We have to expand our cottage industries through ag tech and value added. Pillar three, education and workforce development. Focus on workforce development by establishing career pathways, working with the University of Hawaii, P20, DOE, and our unions. And we have to identify our strengths and weaknesses. You know, there is a story with HTDC that was shared with me by our executive director, Lenny Gashi. A $45,000 investment turned into a $300 million venture. We have macro thinkers here, that's our strength. A weakness we did not see is that we did not prepare a skilled workforce to meet the increase in services and those positions, not all of them, but some of them were outsourced from out of state. And the last pillar is housing. It's a long-standing issue for both affordable and workforce, and it's a critical component of our economic cluster. Lastly, with economic clusters, we want to promote and collaborate between our programs. DBED will drive the projects, partnering with sister agencies and departments, and we'll work with our administratively attached agencies as they have all the tools that can assist with planning, design, and development, a cradle to a grave approach for our economic development. We have to conduct an assessment of infrastructure and assets, what land facilities are state owned or should DBED acquire, and critical infrastructure to support the programs and goals and benchmarks. In closing, I wanna thank you for allowing me to share my summary and how DBED can help Hawaii be competitive. And I'm open for questions, mahalo. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, members, any questions? Thank you, Favela. I, I just don't let you be left out or cut off like, in a rest of the hearing. Thank so you, I, don't you let you I really appreciate you for that. Thank you. Because you know I'm a man of few words. Any? Just, just a few, just a few questions. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Dean. Um, so, uh, uh, sorry. As the various agencies and the visions that you already spoke about in DBED, um, if confirmed, how uh, would you be as a deputy in proposing and, you know, I guess uh, putting everything together um, in, a, you know, in a better, in a responsible way? So the director and I, we've been looking at our attached agencies. Um, they, can, they can become champions of economic clusters. Um, within the pillars and meeting with the Senate, Senate and colleagues, we're learning about economic projects within your communities that are appropriate. We plan to do that if confirmed through site visits in the interim. But we're asking our attached agencies to step up and become the champion. So, for example, 
uh, Food Innovation Network with the Agribusiness Development Corporation. We need to identify land, whether ADC already has it or doesn't have it, if we need to acquire it. What other type of powers do we need from other attached agencies, whether it's HHFDC, that can acquire um, already existing buildings for workforce housing. With creative media, we're looking at them as a driver for a film studio complex out in West Oahu, but also what type of agencies like HCDA has a district out there and partnering with them. And then continuing on with workforce housing and then the workforce pathway with DOE, UH West Oahu, and the unions. Um, if it becomes land-based, we need to look at which state agencies we can partner with. So it's all about collaboration of partners. A lot of our attached agencies include powers and exemptions that can help in moving these projects forward. There kind of just needs to be a maestro, and that's where we're moving our framework with our program. And we meet weekly with our managers to discuss how to move forward on that. We'll touch on the second one, but I'm going to read them anyway, since it's in my book. Um, so, um, my last question. Yeah. In your questionnaire, you responded and mentioned that one of the DBED's top priorities will be receiving funding for $13.2 million to purchase Kalilo Perso for the economic structure, of including a creative media, uh, creative, uh, media industry and film state energy project, dry and or cold storage facility. Mm -hmm. Could you provide more detail about this Kalailoa land area that um, we're going to be purchasing for the project? So it's a little, it's really early. It's, um, we're in talks now. We've talked with the landowners saying we are interested. They're doing their due diligence before they list it. But that idea came up um, from looking at the creative media industry. Uh, UH West Oahu is pursuing a student, uh, their film studio. And for us, we want to look at an asset. If there's capacity to do more stages in Kalelo, we want to focus the hub there. We're looking at the approach of not doing incentives up front. So we, I, you know, it is, it's not unfamiliar to this body about the tax credit. But the tax credit, I believe, can be used as an incentive to draw work into a targeted area. If um, we'll have to look at the census tract to see if there's also an enterprise zone opportunity out there. But if there's not enough capacity to do more than, let's say, half a dozen still film studios out in Kalelo at this point in time. And talking with the ag industry, there is a need for cold storage and dry storage facilities across the state. So we could repurpose it. If DBED holds the asset, we can look at other options to repurpose our assets. And that is something I experienced in working on legislative projects here at my time at the state senate. Where the state had an asset, the first idea didn't work out. Um, maybe better for worse, but now it's turned into a food process production facility. The original idea was just to be a warehouse for food storage. Just a quick comment. So I just wanted to let you know if you're not sure. Um, 53 acres um, was purchased by Costco's from Whole Peely to do some of the stuff you're talking about. Warehouses, um, cold storage is that they're going to want to rent and uh, lease out in that area. 53 acres um, right above I'm hoping. So just wanted to give that. Thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. No. For that. that was the quickest comment ever, but thank you for that. Right on. <laughs> Senator Kim. Oh, no, just we got to go one by way, though. <laughs> thank you, Dwayne. Dane. I know I always say Dwayne. Um, you should put a U after your D. No. Um, so you're the deputy. Right. Yes. So what would your role be as deputy? What do you see your role is as deputy for this department? Thank you. So my, my role, I saw where I can always help and support the director as well as the program managers. Um, where I do see maybe a void or where we can step up, that's where I assert myself or insert myself. But it's always working with the director and the program. So when you say a void, what do you mean a void? It could be where I've recognized maybe we're not implementing or we're short on delivering the economic project. I'd like to propose some ideas for the director or the program managers to help undertake. And what if forward. the director doesn't agree with you? At the end of the day, it's the director and I would have to support the director's decision. What specific assignments have you been given by the director? And uh, which, uh, which specific um, things that you have done have been more taken as, as initiative on your part? Can you differentiate between the two? Sure, yeah. 
So specific assignments is internally leading the programs and direction on where we're headed that we developed the moving the needle plan. Um, I did approach the director asking if I could work on economic clusters and with his approval, I've embedded that and in, included it into the moving the needle. It's the same or similar projects um, I, that I proposed to the director. I proposed to some of the Luna Greens transition team members when I applied, it was specific to economic. And so I approached and asked if I could work on these projects and with approval, he's allowed me to put together this strategic direction and get input weekly from our managers. So again, what were the specific assignments you've been given leading programs? So right now, anything other than the hydrogen hub, the stadium development, uh, prior to that was the HDA contracts, and then housing. Um, those, some of those were inherited by the department that the director um, undertook and is focused on. And then I took all not other economic projects that I see fit for the veterans attached agencies. So did you have any role in the HTA RFPs? No, I did not. So that you didn't have anything to no. do with that? Okay. <coughs> okay, thank you for now. now sure. Sure, don't find any questions. Thank you, Chair. Right, Dave, ever since you came to the Senate in 2010, I found you to be so easy to work with. You're wickedly smart. You are embracing innovation all the time, super collaborative. And we heard today you're a good parent. And that's important because I know you want the best for Pierce, your son, uh, to chase whatever dreams he has. And what I also appreciate about you is that you're honest. And I read through your uh, responses to Chair DeCoy's questionnaire, um, and you point out that one of the weaknesses within DBIT is a lack of a strategic plan. And for years, our approach to economic development has just been kind of haphazard, piecemeal, kapakahi all over the place. And that's why we really haven't moved off of tourism and it seems like you're the right guy to help us finally uh, get some traction. I mean, the previous administration talked about a navigator, talked about Hawaii 2.0, spent millions of dollars in uh, preparing us for absolutely nothing. Um, and so I, I have so much more confidence in you and Mr. Saudi Asu to get us to, to a better place. And I'm looking through your packet of information and you talked to today about um, how you wanna, uh, grow different sectors. I'm looking at this uh, GDP comparison 2000, excuse me, 1999 to 2019. And then you show some growth areas and some areas where there has been economic decline. Growth areas inclusive of healthcare, construction, transportation, uh, professional scientific technical services. The areas in our economy over the past 20 years that are going in the opposite direction and declining are trade, uh, utilities, manufacturing, and agriculture. So when you try to figure out like what the strategic plan is going to be for the state uh, through your role as DIVA deputy director, what's your take? I mean, do you want to emphasize growth opportunities or do you want to try to mitigate some of these declining industries in the state? I don't have the answer on how to mitigate the declining. Um, and speaking with Dr. Tian, my first approach was if I were to focus on value added, would that move the needle in agriculture? And I, what I learned from that conversation, it might touch trade, it might touch manufacturing, it could touch exports. Um, I don't have all the solutions or answers outside of Oahu and meeting with the neighbor island senators. There's a lot of alignment. Um, agriculture seems to be one, film was another one. I have yet to learn more about what those issues are. But the, my focus to, to maybe reverse the, the declining trend is to figure out what is needed our industries, maybe over the next hurdle. So one experience I had, um, and it used to be with DBED, was the Hawaii Strategic Development Corp. They would focus funds on startups and what they call the Valley of Death, seed funding to get over. That Valley of Death, I found, is similar with our cottage industry. So in talking with our business development support division who focuses on exports, my question is how do we increase exports? And then working backwards from those type of vendors, what is it that they need? They might need a certain type of equipment and we can work with HTDC and bringing in that through the manufacturing plant. They might need a facility. The DBED has attached agencies that can purchase land and develop assets. <coughs> but there's gotta be some point where we're working with our current economy and asking them, what's gonna help you scale up or what's gonna take you uh, to the next level? 
And that is part of our plan is, okay, if it's an asset, if it's an equipment in our budget ask or our legislation, we want to change or adapt the law or come in with that request. I hope that in one year, if that's too aggressive, but in two years, we can use the metrics to see if we bought a piece of equipment or if we built a facility on neighbor island, what happened at GDP? How many more jobs did we create? Where do we go on exports and sell? So we got to put together a plan to track that. Yeah, I appreciate the fact that you touched just now on neighbor islands because I just see that the past practices with DBED has been very Oahu centric in terms of uh, building whatever it is, energy, manufacturing, it's all Oahu centric. And we know that neighbor islands are, they have a lot more land, perhaps a lot more yeah. access to, to water, cheaper energy sources. What's your view on DBED's role in pushing more economic development to the neighbor islands? Definitely, we're, we just had a meeting this week with our managers and the director and I um, asked the status or encourage all of our program managers to start doing trips off Oahu, um, figure out ways to engage with the legislators off Oahu and learn about their districts, what's appropriate, and we want to see those reports. We do a lot of travel, we do a lot of conferences outside the state, but I think we need to focus and put more of that effort to the neighbor islands. We'll learn from them the best practices. We can't do, I mean, even if we get one project per county within the first four years, I would think that would be significant. I know that's not a great benchmark when you're talking about a department that's responsible for all statewide economic development. But implementation, and we talked about that, if it's not focused on planning or studies, if it's focused on implementation, basically shoveling the ground within two years. Thank you, Senator Tokumaka. Senator Kim. Question. So you've worked with the Senate um, Budget Ways and Means Office. Um, and so as far as the budget for DBED, what was your role in prepping them for the budget as they came before the, the Ways and Means Committee? So when we were prepping the budget, um, round one, actually round two, um, I worked with the director, um, advised that we should uh, put together meetings to learn the budgets. Um, what was missing, I think on my end too, is there was no clear real ask on benchmarks. Um, so it was hard to kind of justify yet right now. And it, and it was due to timing. I mean, we started mid-December and I, I'm well aware of the budget timeline come January um, to really narrow down how the budget requests are tied to benchmarks and goals. Um, a corrective course we have taken is we started doing strategic planning meetings with our departments now so it's a little late but now to understand what the goals and benchmarks are as we're coming up to the second half of the budget so looking looking back on the presentation for the budget by dbed mm -hmm. uh, and all the ask that was presented before us what, what is your take on that i mean again you know you spent a lot of time with ways and means you know the budget, were you really asked as to what's the best way to approach that and how to deal with all of these asks? Yes, and I would say I was offering a lot of guidance too on my end. Um, but it didn't materialize in front of the committee. That was a, yes, that was a, for my experience coming from a ways and means, that was, that was a challenge putting that together. Okay. I guess I just was expecting a lot more in the sense that, you know, of the experience you have, and if that was not utilized, then I'm wondering going forward how much of your experience will be utilized as a deputy. Is that a fair question? That is fair, and I do think about that post WAM and moving forward and how to correct that. So, some of the requests we've already done is working backwards from December thirty first to prepare so when we do come in front of the committee on our supplemental budget, it's clear on what the ask are for and how it ties into benchmarks and goals. And prioritizing. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. Um, so, so thank you, Dean. And uh, you know, so, so I have a question. Um, what were the biggest problems you saw at the city's Department of Planning and Permitting that caused delays for those seeking permits from the city and can you tell us what fixes were needed to expedite permit approvals? So when we were there, um, there were 
two things. One, where our, the permitting planning system was operating on two software programs that don't, from what I learned, that was told don't talk to each other. So you need manual, a manual person behind clicking and moving things over. Um, with the current director, um, Dante Perucci or Puna, she's now the scope. She focused on using internal staff, um, which helped build morale. But what were the low-hanging fruit on just the checklist system? And they started a bot, an automated bot process. And they set deadlines on when they're gonna do X amount of steps. It was able to clear within, I think we did about two to four weeks of just planning and setting this up. And then within two to three months, it was able to clear the backlog just out of the checklist. But then what happened, you solved one problem, you just moved the backlog to a second phase, but that phase was actually all manpower. So the second challenge that I saw, um, which the director was well aware of and trying to, and working to address was capacity. Um, that you need qualified people. And if once you get qualified people, it would take six to 12 months just to train them up. But when you look at the workforce for any government or even private, the challenge in finding, finding people. We're doing that now with our vacancies. We're still having a challenge as we try to fill our remaining 30 plus vacant positions to qualify people. So, um, so I guess you would say we're still in the same place we were, we, we are now when we were then. For, um, I did hear though on the, on the media that the DPP is going out with a RFP and that would be a big problem um, solver by bringing in a consultant to Work, um, rework the system. Okay. Um, so, first, I'm looking at um, America's top states for business, and Hawaii is ranked 46 out of 50. Of course, we always say we got to improve ranking. Mm -hmm. What would you propose we do to improve the ranking, knowing all the background that you have, and then, um, you know, knowing that you will be the deputy of, or uh, uh, upon a confirming mm -hmm. how's the working relationship with yourself as well as the, the appointee director for DBED because I always believe a, a good supportive um, within its organization or department makes it healthy for us to move projects forward. What, what, what's that like? We have a great relationship, working mm -hmm. relationship. If, if he has strengths in knowing and being like a child of DBED is uh, HHFTC, HTA, and sometime at HCDA. So he's in depth on process and familiar with how they work, that culture. Uh, me bringing in <clears throat> my expertise or experience from the legislative body, I helped navigate. Um, to this point about the CNBC ranking, take it back, I think it was in 2014 or 15 when Dan I was working with Senator Dela Cruz and he was the chair of the Economic Development Committee. We would watch this and we would see Hawaii go, it was always on the bottom of 10. But a, um, a question, and if approved, that I'd like to work on is actually, I was thinking just contacting them and saying, what are your metrics? How do you guys measure why Hawaii is ranked in the top, bottom 10 of business? And then try to align it with, is that, can our industries or where we go with our economic plan, would that help move us up? And at the end of the day, if they're using metrics that doesn't match our economic plan or we can't adapt to it, then it's probably not a table I would refer to later, but figure out, okay, what is, is it, is it the salaries that we increase? Is it the unemployment rate that we bring down, the diversity? When we go back to the top five industries, does something else pop in as the top five and something else move out? Well, well cause I actually think we actually ranked 50. Um, 50. Only because just trying to get through the process of registering businesses and making it more a palatable, um, welcoming of startups. It's been really a challenge. Um, you know, at this point, I would think that we would try to streamline mm -hmm. and no fault of what you're doing. But, um, you know, we've always been bad for business. Um, some islands, they just don't welcome business, um, you know, but at, at that rate, uh, you know, I appreciate, you know, um, the testimony of that background because you have a lot of uh, uh, recommendations as well as your uh, resume speaks for itself. Amen. I appreciate that. Um, if there's no more questions, I'd like to move to recess for decision making. Let's do one last comment. Sorry. Sure. To that point, um, we've been, since coming on board, the program managers, they, 
all of our programs that do a really good job. They've been very open and very creative and coming to the table and thinking of ways to shift the paradigm. I, um, just one of my recent meetings with two of our divisions and flushing out how we could increase imports, I'm sorry, increase exports. They looked at it and came back and said, hey, our platform is more informational. We should be proactively marketing. And so we have a follow-up discussion with that, but the energy and the morale there within all of our managers is very positive. And this is, there's definitely, I think, a lot of opportunity with our program managers. So thank you. I appreciate that, Dan. Uh, uh, you know, maybe it's just, just a stream of the decision. Hang on, hang on. Stream of decision. Okay, um, so, um, so, so we are gonna decision make on a one pm uh, agenda. Uh, first up, uh, GM five zero four submitting for consideration and confirmation as the chief energy officer of Hawaii State Energy Office gubernatorial nominee Mark Glick for term to expire 12-7-2026. My recommendation is to advise and consent. Uh, committee members, any discussion? Seeing none. Um, Vice Chair, what kind for the vote? Chair DeCoy? Aye. I vote yes. Senator Fukunaga, this is to you. Senator Kim? Aye. Senator Favela? Reservations. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, second, uh, GM 534 is submitting for consideration and confirmation as the Deputy Director of Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Gubernatorial nominee, Dane Wicker, for a term to expire. 1207 2026. My recommendation is to advise and consent committee members. Any discussion? Seeing none, Vice Chair Wakai for the vote. Chair DeCoy? Aye. I vote yes. Senator Fukunaga is excused. Senator Kim? Aye. Senator Fabella? Aye. Chair, your recommendations are adopted. Congratulations to our nominees. And with that, we can adjourn this session. Hello and welcome to Senate Committee on Energy, Economic Development and Tourism. We have eight bills on our agenda. This meeting is being live streamed on YouTube in the likely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties. The committee will conve reconvene to discuss business at 2 p.m. on Thursday, March 16, 2023 in District Room 229. Please note we have a one minute time limit for test of our Okay, first up, HB 192, 192, uh, relating to energy efficiency. First up, Kenneth Fink, Department of Health, uh, on Zoom. Uh, good afternoon, Chair DeCoy, uh, Vice Chair Wakai. Uh, I'm Phoenix Grange, representing the uh, Director Fink in, in strong support of this measure. Um, the effect of this measure will be to both increase energy efficiency with the newer, smaller LEDs, but also protect the environment and children from uh, releases of mercury into the environment, which can cause um, significant, uh, you know, uh, bad effects on both children and the environment. So we strongly support this, and um, think that we will see people of Hawaii will see benefits removing this from the environment in the near future. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Mark Glick. Uh, Howard Glick, Hawaii State Energy Office. I second everything Department of Health said and point out that this brings us closer to 100% clean energy. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Leah Laramie in support. Uh, Ranzi Manzor in support. Tina Yamaki uh, in person and in opposition. Not here. Uh, Testifying for Blue Planet Foundation. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Jody Robinson will stand her testimony in support. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Next up, Carolyn Carr on Zoom. I'll present on Zoom, Chair. Okay, next, Brian Fate Fadi, State Policy Manager on Zoom. 
Yes, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Brian Fady with Appliance Standards Awareness Project. We have worked on this policy in uh, other states as well. We stand by our written testimony and mainly just wanted to be available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next up, Jenna Matila on Zoom. Hello, Hi, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Jenna Matilla on behalf of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation with comments on HB 192. Um, the auto innovators support the amendments that were made in the HD2 version of this bill and respectfully ask that the committee pass this measure with the exemption for lamps installed as original equipment in motor vehicles intact, as there are no other alternatives for older motor vehicles. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. So, so, so Jenna, uh, I think you said 182 is 192, you know? Yeah, 192, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, Mike Kamakata in support. Uh, Ted Bolin in support. So again, we have numerous support for this uh, bill. Uh, th is there, if there's anybody else wishing to testify, um, I will remind you we got to stop at three o'clock and we have several bills to go through. Seeing none members, any question? Okay, moving on to HB 963. Uh, first up, uh, Chris. Uh, we stand in our, uh, Chris Sariasi, be the director. Uh, we stand in our written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Luis Salavario in support on, VA, on budget finance. So, yeah, Sabrina Thanks, Nasser, Sabrina. Deputy Director, Department of Veteran Finance. We stand on our written testimony in support. Thank you. Next up, uh, Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Lu. Hi, Chair, Chair Vice Chair, sorry. Uh, Riley Fujisaki to the Office of Lieutenant Governor. We stand in strong support on our written testimony. Thank you. Next up, uh, Bintry Bar told, told us. Uh, oh, thank sorry. you. Can you please state your name? Uh, Kylie. Kylie. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, next up, Garrett Yoshimi in support. Kirby Shaw in support. Uh, testifying on behalf of the Chamber, Sherry Lenore. Thank you, Sherry. Next up, Janine Suki on Zoom. Not present on Zoom, Chair. Okay, in support. Uh, testifying for Broadband Hui on Zoom. So, uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and Committee. We'd just like to uh, stand on our testimony. We'd like to emphasize briefly that state appropriating uh, its money, matching some matching money, gives flexibility in the uh, options available. So. Uh, we strongly support the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, Primary Care Association in support. Uh, Kelly Lopez. Kelly Lopez in support. Uh, Kylie Swan. Good morning. Oh, good afternoon. Sorry. Uh, Donna, Lynn, and Mr. Glenn. My name is Kylie Swan. My name is Kali Swan. I'm a strong supporter of HB 963 because people with disabilities need to get fast, affordable Wi-Fi if they can afford to get one due to the tight budget. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Let me know if you have any questions. I love to ask any questions from you guys. Please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Lemomi Khan in support. Anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? Angela. Aloha Chair and Vice Chair and the committee. I'm Angela Melanie Young testifying on behalf of CARES um, in strong support. And um, so the benefits of digital equity and connectivity um, continues to grow and um, the benefits are, there are a lot of benefits from getting connected. Um, here are some examples about um, how connectivity can benefit um, our society. So for example, economic development, um, education, healthcare, um, public safety, environmental sustainability, um, telework and urban revitalization, and of course, people with disabilities. Um, so especially for disabilities, it addresses um, like um, the apps, so a lot of the disabled people need advanced apps so that it can help them with their disabilities. Um, and such as those who are, um, who have like hearing um, conditions, 
um, can Thank you, talk Angela. to each other with sign language. Yeah. yeah. You, okay. You can submit that. For okay. Testimony. Thank so you for the you. opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, HB 989 relating to Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. First up, Director Chris Sandman, uh, strong support for this uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Gwen Yamamoto Long. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, okay, uh, Senator Kim. For the director. So the last time we took this up, um, you gave us the breakdown after the, we had the hearing. So we didn't really have to ask questions. So now that we have the breakdown, uh, under moving services and related expenses, it's $100,000. And then you have temporary office rent and relocation expenses. Can you explain the difference with Relocation expenses, moving services, and related expenses? So the moving services, as from my understanding, we're working with our um, business development support division and also our, our affected agencies and core divisions. Uh, there will be moving expenses that uh, we have to bid out for that. And we have a quote, I think Dennis is here and explain a little bit more detail. So now I just want to know the, what relocation expense, the difference between relocation expense, related expenses to the moving services, because relocation expenses is also moving? Yeah, in this case, uh, relocation expenses are those rents that we have to pay temporarily while we're out of the uh, building, because uh, we have to relocate to other premises and you know the sites that we're looking at include the convention center and other places. But that's covered under temporary office rent, right? Isn't that under temporary office rent? Oh yes. yes. So what is relocation expenses? Well, oh, that's one in the same. Temporary office of relocation. Okay, so it's ex it's the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's all the same temporary thing. Temporary office. Yeah. And storage. Storage, yes, uh, the current furniture that we have and the uh, equipment needs to be stored because it needs to be completely moved out of the uh, premises. And uh, although we're looking at economical ways of storing it, uh, for instance, at the foreign trade zone, um, <clears throat> it still costs expenses. You would think that all the property and buildings and offices that the state has that we don't have a place that we can store without having to pay eighty thousand dollars. Yeah, well, um, that's uh, the 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 lowest uh, cost that we could come up with was at the foreign trade zone. So we have no empty empty offices anywhere. Not that uh, we've been able to find. How extensively did you guys look? Uh, I believe our our team uh, did look uh, and inquired with DAGs. Okay. Um, so if you're storing, if it's costing us 80000 to store, how much equipment are you actually storing? Uh, that's a lot of the file cabinets, a lot of the, uh, the desk uh, that needs to be stored. Uh, so did you come up with a cost assessment on... What would be the cost to replace all of those things versus what we're paying for rent? Did you have you looked at that? We did, and uh, that was part of the assessment for the partitions. It would have cost us a lot more to store the partitions. Well, for one thing, the partitions couldn't have been replaced anyway because it is too old. Once dismantled, they can't be replaced. Right. So that and that falls uh, under partitions and furniture. Right. So, so that so, so that four hundred and eight thousand dollars of furniture, and yet we're paying another eighty thousand to store furniture or s store something. So I'm just wondering what's the cost effectiveness. Sometimes you know people rent these storage things to store some stuff. At the end of the day, at the end of the year, when you add up how much they pay for rent and what they stored inside, they could have bought brand new stuff. <laughs> just didn't make sense. Yeah. So. Um, did well, you guys do a cost assessment as to what the kind of furniture we have in there that we're storing? And I mean, can it be partitions cost all $408,000? Well, on the partition side, uh, we did get estimates. We did have vendors come in and give us uh, uh, an estimate of how much it would cost to replace. So and what's it, just the uh, partitions? The partitions came out to about 17000 per partition. 
Seventeen thousand per partition. Per, per cubicle. Per, per cubicle. cubicle, yes. And how many cubicles? Uh, there were about yeah twenty twenty yeah twenty. No, there was more than that. So if there's more than that, then you're paying all of this money is going for partitions and not for furniture. It's basically going for partitions. Okay, because it's misleading when you say partitions and furniture is what the breakdown is on that. There are some desks that have to be uh, replaced because uh, some of them are already built in partition desks, uh, which will have to be replaced with uh, Different desks. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. I'll send to Okai. Dennis, if I heard you correctly, you said the storage facility is the foreign trade zone. We are right? looking at the foreign trade zone. So why would they even charge a sister agency eighty grand? Uh, I, I guess it's because they could have used that space for other purposes. Yeah, but that makes absolutely no sense to charge a sister agency eighty grand for use to, of space that. I mean, are you dis displacing somebody to to put your partitions and furniture in, in there? I can't say if they're displacing. Yeah, you should talk to David and ask if he could just give that to you, take that 80 grand off of this uh, balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, so I just wanted to note that we actually got a companion bill that went over that was heard. Um, so. Can I just ask the director? So, what do you think of? I mean, were you part of figuring out how much this is going to cost? And that this is a project save money. This is a project that's been ongoing and it's been discussed. And I was involved in one meeting regard with the team regarding this, and when it was talked about the cost and the estimates and the like. And so, working with them, we put these numbers together in response to the the bill that was uh, heard in the Senate. Right, but does it bother you that we have to spend this kind of money and not really look into whether or not we can save, save some stuff? Because this is actually not your money, it's the taxpayer's money. So, you, but you know, if you have to move your house and you have to find a place to store, you can call your friend, you can call your relatives, you can try to find out if you can garage, you can pour stuff, right? Instead of spending $80,000. So I'm just wondering if you guys put that kind of effort into the saving team, the taxpayers' dollars. The team did look at that, and we will relook at it and get back to you with that further looking, especially um, as Senator Mackay mentioned, to work with uh, David Sikang. Those are the and kinds FDC. of things you as a director should be asking your people and being, you know, and holding accountable and not accepting stuff just like that without questioning. We'll get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to HB 991, uh, relating to Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. Uh, Director Sully Thank you, Senator Thank you. Uh, next up, Lenny Gashi. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> we, uh, we stand on our written testimony in support of this measure. Thank you. Uh, next up, Chamber of Commerce. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, next up, Lauren Zerbo from Testament Boy Food Industry on Zoom. Not present on Zoom, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Herman Kugler in support. Ken Ch Chong, Oceanet Laboratories in support. Oh, all right. So, thank you. Uh, and Caroline Zerbo. Az Kozelski in support. Um, any questions for anyone? Seeing none, moving on to HB 999. Related to Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. First up, Chris, uh, is Chris Sally Austin. Awesome. Senator, uh, Senator Okay. Uh, next up, Len Thank you, Chair. We also stand on Chris. Thank you. Uh, next up, I have Tracy Ty Ty Tyra Carnate in support. Susan Yamada, uh, Pacific Asian Center in support. Uh, Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Uh, okay, I got a lot of people in support. 
on HB 999. Is there anyone in the room wishing to testify on this measure? Seeing none, members, any questions? Okay. Um, HTDC, please. So, so Lena, of course, you know we have a companion bill um, that went over. Um, but WAM and finance changed the appropriations and unspecified amounts. WAM also changed the composition of the HTDC board by specifying that the UH representative shall be the chairperson of the Board of Regents or a designee. Can you describe the projects you will fund and the number of awards you expect to make? Uh, sure. Thank you for the question. So <clears throat> this bill is a, again, it's a blank appropriation, but initially it was an administrative bill with $15 million. And the appropriation was intended to build upon HTDC's core programs. Um, HTDC's core programs being uh, grant programs for small business innovation research, uh, grant programs for manufacturers, uh, upgrading their equipment and also for accelerator programs, which help uh, new businesses get started. <clears throat> this bill builds upon our, our core programs and aligns them with some of the state goals, uh, DBED priorities in terms of uh, digital uh, traded sector and renewable energy or climate change. Uh, we intend, we expect, uh, we've last year we did 300 companies served with, with the programs that we have, and this bill would provide significant more funding. So we anticipate, uh, you know, more than 300. It's hard for me to, you know, to spell out at this time. Okay. Thank you, Len. Okay, uh, moving on to HB1193. Uh, first up, Len. Well, thank Sorry. you, Stan. I have just wanted to call this. Thank you. Uh, next on Zoom, Ann Lopez, AG's office. Not present on Zoom, Chair. Oh, that's okay. It's there in person. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, Senator. I apologize about that. Um, Josh Michaels, Deputy Attorney General. Uh, you have our testimony. We would just like to respectfully note the potential constitutional issue with the 75% requirement and our suggested language. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, tax, taxation, Gary Subo, Su, uh, Numa. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Gary Sugunuma, Director of Taxation. The department stands on his written testimony offering comments, and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, testifying on behalf of the Chair, Sherry Menor. Thank you. Uh, next up, in support, Herman Kugler, in support of Matthew Sullivan uh, for Oceanet. Thank you. And they're testifying for Tax Foundation of Hawaii on Zoom. Uh, thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Tom Yamachika from Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Uh, we will stand on a written testimony, be available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Uh, anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? Seeing none, any questions? Uh, seeing none. Oh, any questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on to House Bill 1194. Uh, relating to Economic Development District Planning Organization. First up and only one up, Scott Glenn from Office of Clearance. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? Seeing none. Members, any questions? Seeing none. Moving on to HB 1408. Uh, in regards to relating to digital equity. Uh, first up, DBED, Chris Salayasu. Standard testimony support, thank you. Thank you. Next up, Daintree Bartoldis, uh, Disability Council in support. Uh, Stacey Aldridge in support. Garrett Yoshimi in support. Leah Laramie in support. Kirby Shaw in support. Kieran Hope. That's why for Compilation of Commerce in support on Zoom. Yeah. Not present on Zoom, Chair. Uh, Janine Suki on Zoom. Not present on Zoom. Okay, testifying for Hawaii Broadband Hui uh, uh, on Zoom. Oh, there we go. 
Okay. Oops. Good afternoon, um, the Chair and uh, Committee. Uh, I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the uh, Broadband Hui. It's a couple hundred uh, people across uh, uh, various uh, organizations, uh, government agencies, and, and private enterprise and providers. The focus of this bill is to bribe uh, money in advance of federal appropriations in order to uh, uh, make sure that people uh, not only have a connection to the to the internet, but rather they have some equipment and they uh, have uh, training so they can use it effectively for healthcare, education, workforce development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Kelly Lopez in support. Lemomi Khan in support and Caroline Alzelski in support. Anyone else in the room wishing to testify? Seeing none, um, we are going to recess for decision making. Uh, ready to decision make on our 1.30 p.m. Uh, agenda. First bill up is House Bill 192 HD2 relating to the energy of e energy efficiency. My recommendation is to pass as is. Committee members, any discussion? Seeing none, for sure, i for the vote. Chair DeCorey? Aye. I vote yes. Senator Fukunaga is excused. Senator Kim? Aye. Senator Fugel. Aye. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Next bill up, HB 963. Recommendation is to pass as is. Any discussion, members? Seeing none, by sure, Kai for the vote. Voting excuse absence of Senator Fukunaga. Any opposition or reservations? I'm seeing her none, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Next, we have HB 989. My recommendation is to pass as is. Committee members, any discussion? Seeing none, Vice Chair will apply for the vote, please. So did the excuse absence of Senator Fukunaga. Any reservations or nays to the uh, Chair's recommendation? I haven't seen and heard none, Chair, your recommendations adopted. Thank you. Next up, HB 991 relating to Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. Recommendation is to pass as is. Committee members, any discussion? Seeing none, Vice Chair will apply for the vote. No need excuse absence of Senator Fukunaga. Only res any reservations or opposition to the chair's recommendation. Having seen and heard none, chair's recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Next up, HB 999HD1, relating to White Technology Development Corporation. Recommendation is to pass with amendments, inserting the language from SB 1297, SD2, establishing a three year Hawaii. Office of Naval Research Grant Program to provide grants to qualified businesses conducting research and development in, in alternative energy and making technical amendments for clarity and consistency. Committee members, any discussion? Seeing none, Vice Chair Clay for the vote, please. No, the, ex the excuse absence of Senator Fukunaka. Any reservations or opposition to the Chair's recommendation? Having seen and heard none, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Next up, HB 1193. HD1 relating to the tax credit for research activities. Uh, recommendation is passed with amendments, noting the concerns and amendment suggestions from dual tax, taking the suggested amendments, making the certification deadline March 31st on page three, line 15, changing taxable year to calendar year. Add the suggested language on page two, subsection B to prevent the credit from being claimed on research that has been funded by tax exempt receipts, such as a grant. Also noting the concerns raised in the Attorney General testimony and taking the recommendation to delete paragraph two of the definition of qualified high technology business on page 13, lines four to seven, and add new wording for the definition beginning on page 13, line one, qualified high technology business shall have the same meaning as in section 235. 5-7.3C provided that the business shall be registered to do business in the state. Committee members, any discussion? See none, Vice Chair Kai for the vote, please. Noting the excused absence of Senator Fukunaga, any opposition or reservations to the Chair's recommendation? Having seen and heard, not Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. 
Next up, HB 1194 HD2 relating to an economic development district planning organization. My recommendation is to pass as is. Committee members, any discussion? Seeing none, Vice Chair will cry for the vote. Noting the excuse absence of Senator Fukunaga, any opposition or reservations to the Chair's recommendation? Having seen and heard none, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. And our final bill is HB 1408 HD3 relating to digital equity. Our recommendation is to pass as is. Committee members, any discussion? Seeing none, Vice Chair will cry for the vote. Noting the excuse absence of Senator Fukunaga, any reservations or opposition to the Chair's recommendation? Having seen and heard none, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. And with that, we can adjourn this hearing. Mahalo for being here today. Adjourned.